You cannot place statues or build memorials in thin air. These airplanes, rescued, restored, returned to the sky, are the memorials. Through them, we give enduring thanks to those who gave everything they had to defend everything that we hold dear. By sharing them, we remind each other of the sacrifice. By sharing them, we introduce our heirs to their heritage. One week each summer, these national treasures are flown here. Twice each day, those who restored them present them to those who risk their lives to fight in them. And those who really did it tell the rest of us how it really was. It is a singular series of history lessons that anyone who cherishes liberty ought to see. For 20 years, Warbirds in Review has given you a rare glimpse into the past. Through planes, technology, and most importantly, through the tales of those who know these birds the best. The remaining few from the greatest generation who flew in and worked on these planes. For one week a year, we create a living museum that changes yearly and daily. And all of a sudden, from out here, the B-17s down here, Three ME-109s come in here. They're bellied up to us. You know, they didn't see us, obviously, because there was, you know, seven, seven or eight of us. They're going after the straggler. So, okay, guys, I'm, I'm, flight, I'm a flight leader. One of those is mine. Warbirds in Review started as an idea born from the realization that any time an owner or pilot was out with the airplane, crowds appeared. What if we could capture this magic and share it with more people? What if we could get these experts to share their wisdom, knowledge, and their personal stories with anyone who was interested? The idea for Warbirds in Review started several years ago. Uh, on our many trips to Oshkosh, we find that people are very interested in the airplanes. Um, when you're pre-flighting an airplane or when you're working on it, the, uh, the crowd would gather. And so we said, why don't we do a formal time frame to just allow people to uh, come visit with the pilots. But initially, it was to have the aircraft owner uh, in front of their airplane uh, and set a time when people could come and know that they would be able to hear about the airplane. From that, it evolved into, well, if we're going to have the P-51 here and someone talk about it, and you have the old Crow airplane, wouldn't it be wonderful if people could hear Bud Anderson's story? Wouldn't it be wonderful if people could hear from Jack Roush how he restored the airplane? So from that, uh, that idea, uh, it has uh, grown and to a point that uh, maybe it's a little too hard to handle, but the, the rewards are great. It started with a simple boombox and aircraft stairs and many impromptu lessons and tales. 
all of that has changed. There were two things that uh, made us uh, a lot of focus on us was the fact that we were the first guy that ever defeated the Japanese. And uh, so there was a lot, of, we were losing everywhere in the world at that time. This was in 41 and 42. Our, our idea was for a contract was for a year, and our group broke up in July of 1942. But uh, uh, the whole, whole key to our success was uh, the tactics that uh, General Chanel taught us. He, uh, he, he just drilled it down ahead a very simple thing, and that is you don't turn with the Japanese aircraft. Because if you do, you're going to get shot down. If you even think about turning, the minute you start to turn with that guy, you're going to bleed off the air speed. You find out you can't turn inside of it, and then, then you try to break off, and even though you've got a faster airplane, you can't spool up fast enough to get away. As a result of that tactic, we were paid for 297 airplanes, and we only lost four pilots in air combat, so it worked real good for us. Today, visitors climb into the stands, eager to find a good seat so they can let the stories wash over them, so they can learn and listen to those who know these tales best because they live them. Dick, um, start us off, would you? There you were in the right seat of the B-25, yeah. the lead airplane to leave the aircraft carrier, April 18, 1942. <laughs> and in the left seat, Lieutenant Colonel and Lieutenant Colonel, um, Jimmy Doolittle. <laughs> um, what kind of a man was he? And how well did you know him at that point, Dick? Well, they was uh, uh, back in 1990, uh, I had written some uh, little notes uh, concerning my thoughts about Colonel Doolittle. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, no, uh, yeah. Oh, you go. He's <laughs> <laughs> always ahead of you, all the time. Uh, actually, Colonel Doolittle was five foot six. But uh, the way I, I was able to put it together was he was short in stature, but tall on accomplishment. A man of integrity, honor, and courage. He excluded confidence, determination, and strength. He was intelligent, educated, and humble, great respect for others, led by example and inspiration to all, and we would have followed him anywhere. For a moment, the years slip away and stories that haven't been told for decades are dusted off and shared with a new generation. Old tales that have been told repeatedly grow and are retold with emotion and meaning. Imaginations are sparked and the truly brave few are willing to let in the lesson and learn so that history does not repeat itself. Uh, the P-38 to the right, Connie just mentioned Ron and Diane Fagan from Minnesota. They are giant supporters of EAA and Warbirds in Review. Uh, please welcome Ron Fagan and his son, Evan. Ron and Evan, would you come out, please? What is it like for you, as a young man, to fly this World War II airplane, especially the way you've configured it? Well, it's, it's an honor to fly it. Just to get to be around these has been an honor. But, um, you know, Scat is, and Robin Olds, you know, and I'm sure most of you have read his book. It's a pretty amazing life the guy had. Um, quite an American, and having an airplane with his, his name on it is, is an honor in its own. But 
P38 for our family also takes a special meaning because my grandpa was uh, on the 4th Infantry, first wave of Utah Beach, and always talked about how his group was pinned down and two P38s came down and uh, shot all the Germans, and that's was he, he said he survived due to the P38, so to get to fly the airplane, uh, pretty big honor. Normandy for a few minutes. Okay. We're <laughs> getting there. I know that's old stuff to you people, but I'd like to tell you how I'm here. I got to the plane. I was on number one plane of, 40, of uh, 47 planes of the battalion. The commanding officer, he said, James, there's a correspondent that's sitting in your seat next to me and you're going to be signed to a different airplane. So he said, go to so-and-so plane. I, today, I still don't know what plane I was on. Nobody has a manifest to show the plane that I was on. I can't even prove that I jumped into Normandy. So when we got over Jersey and Guernsey, in the middle of the channel, we got flack. And we got across the channel right on the mainland and all hell broke loose. If you ever been to a, a, a night of fireworks, that's what it looked like. About two minutes, three minutes later, the green light came on and I got up, everybody got up and started pushing and I was shoving. We got just about everybody out and the guy in front of me, he was carrying a 60 millimeter mortar on him. The guy in front of me slipped, slipped on the floor. Got him on his feet, hooked up, back hooked up, kicked him out of the airplane, and I jumped. It seemed like three hours because stuff was coming through my parachute, and you could hear the bullets and shrapnel coming through my parachute. A lot of people got killed on the way down. Finally, I hit the, I didn't hit the ground at all. I hit a bunch of cows, as I said, and they start mooing. So I figured, I said, hell, if they start mooing, they must be ashamed. The Germans didn't know what was going on, so I started to move too. I thought I would say that the plane that hit the target that night was the command plane of the battalion, and it landed right in the middle of a bunch of SS troopers. Half of the men on that plane were murdered, including the commanding officer of the battalion, and half of them were captured. The whole plane, that's the one that I was supposed to be on. Out of the whole regiment, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, 35% of the officers never saw action because they were either killed wounded or captured, 35% of the officers. But then, of course, it struck us that we had a hell of a job. But they expected 60% casualties. So we did pretty good. You know, when you think about it, how many times will we hear a first-hand account of what happened at Normandy? And we've just heard it right now. A favorite at Warburton Review is Bud Anderson, a triple ace of World War II, a fighter test pilot, wing commander in the Vietnam War, and a retired full colonel who went on to earn a well-deserved spot in the National Aviation Hall of Fame. And all of a sudden from out here, the B-17s down here, 
three ME 109s come in here. They're bellied up to us. You know, they didn't see us, obviously, because there was, you know, seven, seven or eight of us. They're going after the straggler. And I've got this guy. And, but we're not in these nice concentric circles. And uh, so I'm saying, I'm going to pull through him and then fire a burst out here and hope he flies through it. I'd been through three gunnery schools and I knew how to shoot quail. You really want to get it back here at six o'clock and get into a close to shoot somebody. So he comes around, I pull it through. I can't see him, of course, because I'm bellied up like this and he's bellied up like this. I fire, I got, got tracked him very accurately, fired a long burst like that. Not a long burst, but a burst. And when he came into sight, He's cooling, st is streaming. He's, he's, he's burst gray smoke just pouring out of him. Lucky shot. I got him with a golden BB. And he pulls up like this right there and bails out immediately. And man, I said, oh, you know, I'm kind of sitting there cheering. And, uh, and I looked out at my wing and, geez, here's a guy right on my wing. And it was Johnny England, England Air Force Base. You know where that is? This is the guy that was uh, the base was named after. And he'd already had a couple of victories. And I, I and he, we were down low. He had his mask off, and he was laughing, and he went like this. And and I thought, wait a minute, did that guy shoot that thing down out from under me? You know, I knew it was a lucky shot, and I just couldn't. Uh, you know, and I thought, holy smokes, that wasn't very sportsmanlike, but, you know, I, I guess there's a war on, it's okay. <laughs> I just, I just, it, it just kind of, I don't know. You know, I got real disappointed. I thought, oh, yeah, I knew if I had hit it, it was lucky. Was he back here and shot that thing down and I didn't see him? And we go in, and we have a briefing. I asked my wingman, he says, you know, I was out of position. I couldn't see that, but I don't think he was there. And so I filed a claim and asked him to hold it. And uh, it looked at me kind of funny when they said that. I said, yeah, I got to talk to a guy and get a confirmation. So uh, I head over to the club, and uh, where he's in a different squadron, obviously. And so now... I'm on the way over there, and I'm thinking, how the hell do I bring this up, you know? I'm going to say, hey, you, uh, ass, uh, you jerk, uh, <laughs> did you shoot that thing down out from under me? Or, you know, how am I going to handle this without being a, a jerk myself? So uh, I go in there, and there he is on the end of the bar, and he comes rushing over to me, and he says, Andy, he says, that's the greatest shot I ever saw. You got that sucker out there at 60 degrees angle off. I go like this, oh, you know, Johnny, lucky shot. <laughs> That's the story how Bud Anderson got his first victory. Warbirds in Review is now more than just a place for a few to gather and listen. It's a celebration of those who sculpted history. It's a place for veterans to gather and reconnect, to share their experiences with others. Even the most versed in the past will not truly understand until they hear it from the people who lived it. As one wasp once put it, you may know our history, but you don't know our stories. Schutze, start us off here. You're the star here today. What's your first memory of being interested in flying airplanes as a kid? Well, that's going back a long way. <laughs> well, you just told me you were really 39, so it's not that <laughs> long ago. Well, you got to turn that one around. <laughs> when I was seven, I said to my family, when I grow up, I'm going to learn how to fly. But I had the interest long before that. What was your parents' reaction to your telling them that you wanted to fly. You're crazy. Girls don't fly. Boy, so what did you do? I mean, obviously you figured it out along the way. How did you go about it? Well, I didn't really figure it out. I just knew I wanted to fly. I see an airplane go by. And when I was a youngster, an airplane going by one every 10 days, that was a big traffic pattern. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just 
studied. I, when I, after I learned how to read, I read everything I could on aviation. I even took my brother's Boy Scout magazine and read the articles on aviation there. I was really gun ho So how did you get around your parents not wanting you to fly? I mean, you had to raise the money, you had to keep it from them. What did you do? Well, they were very supportive. If you had a oh. dream, they figured, try it. If you don't make it, at least you had a dream. Oh. No use going through life without a dream. When I, w when I reported for this ground school, I found out that there was a scholarship involved. Five scholarships, of which only one could be a woman. There was only two women in the class, so I figured I had it made. <laughs> but I also found out that the guys that were taking the course had taken it three or four times, so I figured that pass on perfect attendance. I took the private pilot's license at the end of the course, and the five highest score would get the flight scholarship, and I was one of the five. And then what happened? They took it away from me. What did they say when they took it away from you? The war in Europe isn't going well. We need men. We don't, women don't fly, so we're going to give it to number six. So what did you do to get around that? I fought it to and nail. My argument was, you gave it to me, it's mine, you're giving it away, you're stealing it. So I think I made such a fuss, they gave it back to me just to shut me up. <laughs> Each person has a different story to tell, and it's only through all of them that we get the whole picture. Of course, we can't get all of their stories. Many are lost to war and time, and some simply will never be shared. But we can learn from the stories we have. So where did it come from in you and your colleagues to be able to say, I will not only join to defend the country, but I'm going to join and fight racism. What did it take inside you to do that? Well, I think uh, number one, and I think the first thing that we were all thankful that we had parents and grandparents that said, go to high school, go to college, let's get an education. And that was a requirement when uh, the war broke out to uh, have that education, so that was important. In my own kind of growing up, uh, I, I did learn, uh, I guess you might say from a religious point of view, you know, treat your neighbor as yourself, as you want to be treated. Uh, a little later uh, in my years, I was glad to be a Boy Scout. And I still say that if we all live by that scout oath and those 12 scout laws, you know, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and, and reverent. reverent. If we all, yes indeed, folks, if, if everybody lived by those laws, we'd have quite a different country. But that was the type of thing that helped me. And we, I realized fighting doesn't solve an issue. You're bruised and, and, and you're still mad at each other. <laughs> so it takes a little different way of living. And, and uh, I think that's what sustained the majority of those that became a part of this first experiment, because the Army said we studied and we know it isn't going to work. So that was the term, they called it the experiment. Exactly, they all, the experiment was authorizing the 99th Pursuit Squadron. Of course, the fine print to maintain segregation said all of the necessary support, taking care of still segregated overseas, but attached to white groups, but not at the same base. 
In the history of the United States Air Force, Colonel McGee holds the record for flying the most combat fighter missions in three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, 409. What are the challenges to our country today? I put in four Ps, perceive, prepare, perform, persevere. But perceive, you know, dream your dreams, but I like to add, as you find your talents, hopefully find something you enjoy doing. Because hate to go to work every day, but hate what you're doing. But prepare, I say, get a good education. Read, write, and speak well, but develop the talents. That You know, you know we're losing some of that because they don't even teach kids how to write anymore in some schools. <laughs> so, but prepare, perform. And I say, let excellence be your goal in everything that you do. And tell the youngsters, never less than your best. Because if you're doing less than your best, you're letting yourself down, you're letting your family down, your community. But finally, persevere as we did. Don't let the circumstances be the excuse for not achieving. Can't beat that, I don't think. And that's what I like to pass on. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Charles McGee. Thank you kindly. At times, surrounded by the support and the wide-eyed curiosity of others, veterans are prompted to tell tales they've never shared before. Sometimes families are hearing these stories for the first time, getting a deeper glimpse into their loved ones and what it truly meant to be at war. The way the mission started out, uh, you, uh, you, you're you going to go on your first mission now after we did some practicing around England. We flew into France. The first time that you see the flag starting to come up, well, that, that's, gee, look at that. that. You know, these little bursts around. And, uh, and then you're looking over and you see a plane get hit. That goes down. But it was like a movie. It wasn't happening to you. It's just you're out there watching this thing kind of all hell is breaking loose around you. After the bombs are dropped, Potted took over, and you'd make your turn and, and get out of there. One thing I remember is that, well, I was 20, year old, 20 years old then. I wasn't really drinking by that time. But one of the things they did, take you in the briefing room, and right in the middle of the table was a bottle of old overhauled rye whiskey. And everybody had to have a couple of shots of that. Well, my Uncle Jack and I have talked about um, some of his World War II experiences from time to time over the years, uh, and I finally, uh, I always thought that he was on a B-29, and he'd always correct me. <laughs> finally, I got it right that he was on a B-17 in World War II, and I, I was talking to some of my pals, uh, Gary Weaver. Gary Sinise, a, a venerable actor and director, uh, has been a friend of the DAV since 1994. Uh, his performance in the movie Forrest Gump, uh, his character as Lieutenant Dan Taylor, he said, Gary, you've got a, you've got a B-25, that's wonderful, but you know, you know anyone who has a B-17 or access to a B-17? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do, uh, believe it or not. He, he looked at me and, and wondered if I was just kidding with him. And then he went on to say, my uncle, my Uncle Jack, was a navigator on a B-17 during the war. And uh, he flew 30 missions, survived those 30 missions, obviously. You think it would ever be possible that I could get him a ride on a, on a B-17? I said, but we got to keep it a secret. As I said to Uncle Jack, I said, you know, okay, June 23rd, you're going to Texas. And so I told him that my band was going to play down here, and, you know, I wanted him to come and experience the concert. And, well, we fooled him as long as we could. We told Uncle Jack that we were recording his remembrances for an oral history project. At this point, he was still not aware of the surprise that awaited him. 
Okay. You, you guys wouldn't tell me what this is all about. Well, look what we have right in here. You are a navigator, correct? Right. Well, we're getting ready to go fly, and, and our navigator called in sick today. So well, you, would you do us the honor of going flying with us today? You, what, you, you're going to actually go flying? If you'll go. Well, sure I'll go. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, would you like Why to go not? along? I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You want to go on a ride? Sure I do. I wanted to be right with Uncle Jack to sort of experience, you know, his first time in the plane and, and be there when we took off. And uh, just watching his, his face was pretty, pretty awesome. One thing we've learned from these encounters is things aren't as they seem. Take Luftwaffe pilot Gunther Rahl a pilot for the German army is first to say he was a Luftwaffe pilot, not a member of the Nazi party. There was a difference, and it's through these differences that we can discover similarities. First of all, you know, I have to say that today it's very easy Nazi officer. We, that's nonsense. An active officer was not allowed to be neither in the Weimar Republic nor with Hitler. I, he was not allowed to be a member of a party with the slogan, the officer serves his country in another party. We would fly close formation 45 minutes ahead of the bombers into Frankfurt, and then we'd split up like this in a fan, and I was in this westernmost flight. We were supposed to fly 15 minutes and then do a reciprocal on that heading and come back. Well. I completed over 15 minutes, turned around to come back, and every, I heard, everywhere I listened, everybody was seeing bogeys, the Germans were all over the place. And shortly after that, I looked in front of me, and there's a gaggle of that 109, close formation, still had their tanks on. So uh, with my flight of four, I pressed the attack, and they saw us coming, and all of a sudden, all those tanks went off at the same time, and they don't go down like a bomb, they, they flutter. And I'd, I'd never seen that. That got my attention, but only for a short time. And I pressed on to, to make the attack. And they saw us coming, obviously. And then the whole gaggle did split asses. They went in every direction. And I picked out two and tied onto them. And away we go. Nothing could die with the P-47. I pulled onto one to the left. They didn't move. They didn't do anything to evade me. I gave them a good burst. Smoke started to come from it and the right gear fell out. So it started a slow spiral going down. I just had a little right rudder. Same thing happened to that one. Had his right gear fell out. And it was the two of them going spiraling down together. That was my third and fourth of that day. So about that time I looked over and there's a 109 climbing up under Hub Zemke's butt. And I called to him and I said, break, you know. He said, where is it? And like a dumb lieutenant, I said, he's climbing right up under your ass. And I thought he'd get all over me when he got back to briefing, but he didn't say one thing about that. And I managed to just get a few short bursts on the, around the cockpit. <clears throat> Excuse me, I didn't think I had him. But the airplane slid off to the right, and the pilot bailed out. And that was my fit for the mission. And then I was tumbling, tumbling and tumbling and tumbling. I couldn't reach the handle. But you know, with, when you, these arms and legs uh, swinging around, this is a stabilizing factor for, for, for you. And all of a sudden, it was quiet. I was looking how high, and I pulled, and here I was on the parachute. And then, I <laughs> recognized, I said, Shorty, where's my thumb? <laughs> Thank you.
if there is a war, you have to serve your country. There's no doubt. And the other one on the other side, he serves his country. Mm. <laughs> I'd be all right. I'm a very emotional guy for a fighter pilot, I'll tell you. But I love this country. And every young person who lives here ought to be blessed to know that they've been so fortunate to be born here. And when the time becomes, if you have to do your thing for your country, you better damn well step up to the bat and do it. Oh, three wars and I'm still here. I'm 88. I feel fine. I'd go to f tomorrow and fight, but I wouldn't fight against Gunther. We're friends. I know. <laughs> <laughs> The success and popularity of Warbirds in Review, along with the dwindling numbers of World War II veterans, opened our eyes to the importance of celebrating other veterans in other wars and documenting their history as well. Uh, I got home about the 20 or the last day of September, 1st of October, on a Friday. My family in Washington, and I'm on leave. Phone rang Saturday. He said, get over here to the Pentagon. Chief of Staff wants to see you Monday morning. I said, I'm on leave. He said, it doesn't matter. The chief wants to see you. I said, yes, sir. Okay. I reported into his office. He's the one that walked up to me and said, take off that mustache. Said, yes, sir. <laughs> the next thing I knew, he briefed me, and I'm in the Oval Office of the White House. You know, I'd... God, me? <laughs> LBJ was the president. So I'm sitting on the end of a couch, he's on an easy chair, and his aide, a colonel, Air Force colonel, was sitting on my right. And Mr. President said, uh, uh, welcome home, colonel. Uh, you, you did well. Thank you very much, sir. Said, well, uh, what's it like to be home? That was the weekend that thousands and thousands of hippies marched on the Pentagon. I said, sir, uh, who are all those funny looking people that marched on the Pentagon yesterday? He, and I'm gonna quote for you folks. He said, I got 240,000 boys over there in Vietnam. When those boys come home, they'll tell the American public what's happening. And I thought, wait a minute. Not me. That's your job, not mine. Well, of course you don't say that. So the best thing I could think of to come up with, I said, sir, I've been home since Friday. Been to a couple of dinner parties. No one asked me where I've been or what I've been doing for the past year. In case somebody does ask, what would you like me to tell them? And I'm thinking, you know, end of career. <laughs> he glared at me and then he said, well, Colonel, you tell them, I'm quoting, that we are preventing the North Vietnamese from interfering in the democratic process in South Vietnam. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't say that. Well, why not, Colonel? Well, sir, if that's why we're there, I don't want to be the one that spreads the word. Ooh. It was grim for a few minutes, but I hand the man full credit. He, he let me talk, he listened. I maintain we had every reason to be there, but we went about it improperly under the leadership of McNamara and Johnson. Our standard was, we're off the ground in two minutes. That's it, two minutes. So I came in, I hit the spot, got down on the ground, safe, and here were the true heroes in that. My crew chief and medic looked at me and I said, go get them. And here we're sitting in a minefield and nobody's moving. Everybody's dead or wounded. They start going, running through the minefield and they're carrying the patients back to the aircraft. And I'm sitting in the right seat looking out the door and boom, they step on a mine or set off a mine. 
and they got a great big guy on a litter, and I think he saved my two guys. The rest of the shrapnel went into the aircraft and him, and then the concussion just blew them up in the air. They land, they put him on the aircraft, and they go back and get the rest of the patients. Each story is a personal chapter. Many are shared with others, but told from different perspectives. One thing that remains constant, no matter who the narrator is, the supporting characters in battle and in aviation are as important as the main character. Without them, the telling of the story wouldn't be possible. No matter the era, the stories resonate. So what happened that day? So it's the seventh mission that day you're referring to, I'm assuming, is Black Hawk Down, October 3rd, 93. Right. Uh, the, uh, the mission that day is to go capture two top 10 personnel. We'd already captured the number two guy and we captured 25 others. So we had 26 already in prison. Uh, about 40 minutes in, we lose our first aircraft and uh, it was Super 6-1. And how many aircraft were there? There were over 20 on the mission. So that's when I got called in uh, to replace that first aircraft. So when you, when you get called in to replace somebody who just got shot down, I mean, that's, it's not gonna be a good day. We roll in, we made it around about three times when uh, we got hit by an RPG. And the RPG hit uh, just underneath that big round gearbox casing that you can see right there. And it essentially blew everything off from that point up. Uh, the only thing you can do in that situation is shut the engines off, which is not something you really wanna do either. But you have to to get control of the aircraft and somewhere during that process, we hit the ground. And uh, So when you hit, who was injured? Anyone? Oh, we were all injured very bad, yeah. Uh, we hit so hard that my right femur actually snapped off on the seat, just the pure G-forces of the impact. And then my vertebrae were crushed in my spine. Not, not the discs, but the actual bones themselves smashed into each other and one compressed 30%, so the compression fracture is. So we fought uh, the enemy off for, I'd say, maybe 15 minutes. Gary Gordon goes down first. Uh, Randy then comes back around, and I think at that point, it's just me and Randy. I don't think anybody else has left. I've shot all my ammunition. He gives me Gary's weapon. He grabs the crew chief's weapons from the aircraft and goes back around and makes his last stand. Uh, they estimate, you know, th there's hundreds of Somalis here, so it's a matter of seconds before he, he just can't hold them all off. So he's killed, and then they overrun the site. Um, initially, pretty certain they're going to kill me because they're all out of control, angry and violent, and there's nothing you can do. I mean, you can't run, you can't hide, got no ammunition left. Um, so I basically accepted my fate. So they descended on me and started to uh, beat me to death. I mean, they broke my nose, my cheekbone, my eye socket. They uh, were ripping all my gear off. They realized I had value as a prisoner, stopped the, the madness, fired shots in the air, got control of the mob, and uh, brought me into captivity. Uh, and then when they made the video and it aired, obviously everybody knew that I was in captivity. But then the president sent the former ambassador, a gentleman named Robert Oakley, and he met with him and he said, you got two choices. And I, I heard him tell this story to me more than once. He said, I told him you could keep him in captivity or you can let him go. If you keep him, sooner or later we're gonna figure out where he is and we're gonna come rescue him. And when we do, we're coming with everything we got. And uh, he had credibility, so when he said that, the Somalis said, I think the best course of action is let him go. And within 48 hours, they let me go. Wow. <laughs> Minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1. Two young men 
had a dream many years back, and their dreams took them around the moon. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. decision was made somewhere that you all were going to read from the book of Genesis Christmas Eve. Um, was that a long-term plan that came from no, the I, government? Well we, were, well, we were in the middle of, of training. I got a call from NASA PR, and they said, well, you're going around the moon on Christmas Eve. You'll be a television program. You'll have the largest audience that's ever listened to a human voice. And I said, good. What, what is, what's on the program? And they said, and this was another wonderful thing about America, that the only instructions that we got was do something appropriate. Was there any pu pushback when you got back to Earth? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> we were sued. <laughs> what? We were sued for combining government and uh, religion oh, together. The First Amendment? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, when the three of us went to uh, give a report to the uh, combined uh, co all of Congress and the Supreme Court and everything, uh, that was mentioned and uh, the Supreme Court said, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't ask for a better lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Your position is good, Joe. Actually, Joe didn't fly the T-34 that much, but he did fly some other things that I think you people would be interested in. Uh, space Shuttle X-15. So, Joe, tell us about a typical mission in the X-15. It, uh, it, the mission itself lasted anywhere from 10 to 12 minutes, depending on whether it was a speed flight. Normally, be about 10 and a half minutes long because you you burn burn the propellant out full throttle, and it, it, the propellant was gone in a minute and a half. The engine would burn for about 88 seconds, and then you're out of fuel. The rest of it was just coasting and deceleration and getting data. Uh, and you would decelerate because you were only at about 100, 110,000 feet. So it, it was a, a good bit of drag. The altitude flights, altitude flights lasted uh, at least 12 minutes long because you, you were arcing over the top, literally in space above the atmosphere, and and uh, it would just take that long to arc up over the top, make the re-entry, and then set up and land. So both missions lasted in the neighborhood of 10, 12 minutes. Uh, about a minute and a half apart. It's really hard to build up flying time in that X-15 at, at uh, 10 minutes of flight. Um, but they were. It, it was a. It was a very exciting airplane to fly. It was an honest airplane, and um, uh, you, you felt comfortable in it, except in a few instances when you got close to the edge of the envelope, and either during the re-entry or at very high speeds. It is through the looking glass of time that we see the human drive to explore and innovate. Aircraft innovations don't just come from the large corporations and the military. Dick Rutan, U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, retired, 20 years active duty, soloed at 16, 325 missions in Vietnam. He is a founding member of the Misties, flying the F-100 as a forward air controller. 
He was shot down and rescued, highly decorated with five distinguished flying crosses, silver star, 16 air medals, and the Purple Heart. He and Jeannie Yeager set the world record flying brother Bert Rutan designed Voyager nonstop, unrefueled, around the world. So how accurate is it, uh, the thought that you and Bert were sitting in a coffee shop or restaurant and he sketched it out on a napkin. Is that accurate? No, that's, that's accurate. In fact, most great airplanes start either in a restaurant or in a bar with a drawing on a napkin. <laughs> that's kind of traditional. How much did it go from the napkin to the realization of what he had to do uh, in terms of design to make that happen, even though he understood carbon fiber could potentially make it happen? Well, up until the little, uh, it's a good question, up until the time we met in the restaurant, uh, he never put pen to paper or even uh, worked out any kind of numbers and you know, all the formulas those genius designers <laughs> used to do airplanes. He never did any of that. And this was kind of a concept that he had in his mind. And thank goodness the Voyager ended up to be looking nothing like what he drew on the napkin that oh, day. Oh, really? <laughs> Warbirds in Review has been there to document celebratory moments, grave danger, and the incredible innovations. And yet, it seems there's always time for good-natured humor. I'd like to tell you one quick story. Uh, the, the sayings that Tech Hill uh, had were, were just uh, wonderful. We uh, have been at uh, many black tie occasions with Tex, and on one occasion I happened to wear a red dress. And uh, thanks at no loss for words, I walk out of the room and there he is, and he said, Oh, you make a bulldog break his chain. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a good thing for the text. Uh, but uh, that, that's just so typical of, uh, of text. And, uh, and one word about Robin is that he was a great combat leader. He gave a speech at a spaghetti factory restaurant one night, and he had us all ready to join up and, uh, and uh, follow him anywhere. So he was a great leader. Uh, again, it's my pleasure, uh, it, and I, I can't, uh, I have to thank Ed because uh, the many, many hours and the many long nights uh, that, uh, that I spend working on this, Ed's very patient, very supportive, and a lot of help. And to all the other volunteers, Danny, Sam Bass, they do a wonderful job with the moderating. So this is not a one-man show, uh, but it does take a lot of work, but you are what makes it all worthwhile. Thank you, guys. Of course, the people, pilots, and veterans are a key element to the success of Warbirds in Review, but it's also about the planes. As the pilots fly west, the aircraft are left behind to be discovered by new owners. These new owners and pilots become the modern stewards of the next generation. It is their mission to carry the plane forward for future generations and to make sure the songs these Warbirds sing continue to be heard. At Warbirds in Review, we are proud of the moments we have been able to capture and share over the last 20 years. But we couldn't have done any of it without the veterans and their willingness to share their stories. The aircraft owners who work carefully to restore and maintain these flying pieces of history for future generations. The support we get from Scott's miracle Grow and the Fagan Fighters World War II Museum. The countless Warbirds volunteers who give so much more than just their time and talents to our organization. 
and the warbird enthusiasts who come in increasing numbers every year. Why is there still passion for these warbirds? What do they mean to people and why do they keep coming to see these magnificent metal birds and to hear their stories? Perhaps it's best summed up by the legendary World War II pilot and former POW, Bob Hoover. When you first lose your freedom, and I've said this to so many young people, you don't know what we have here in this country till you can't see that red, white, and blue flag. You don't know what that stands for. That's freedom. 